Hogstock. Hey everybody, welcome to the Hogstock. We are one week away from the Washington football team no longer being called the Washington football team and having some other Ooh. stupid name. Uh, if you didn't hear, uh, and th- this is just a little tangent, Charles Mann was on uh, one of the local radio stations uh, because they're doing the whole 30th anniversary of the 91 team. Uh, and so Mann was on, I don't know if it was 980 or 1067, said how much he hates the new name. And he apparently, <laughs> he said... He and some of the other like famous players were told, "Here are the final three names," and he thought they were all awful. Like, you know, he he just said they all stunk out loud. Good for man for having the guts to say it out loud. What we all are probably thinking. You yeah, know. yeah. I, I I give him credit for being honest. Whereas you know, a lot of these guys are like, "Oh, you know, the new uniforms are going to be fantastic." Joe, yes, man, thighs, and, and, you know, same thing. Like, he's always going to say, yeah, the team's doing the, the right thing here, no matter I what. I haven't seen Joe say anything, but, you know, I mean, Jason Wright obviously is going to say it's fantastic. Ron Rivera is going to say it's fantastic. Yeah. And by the way, neither one of them are old school Redskins from the glory days. No, <laughs> you no, know? of course not. <laughs> yeah. Of course not. Um, yeah, but, Steve, you're not in the area. If you were in D.C. today, it was Nostalgia Corner because every station – all they did was had, have interviews with guys from that 91 Super Bowl team. It was pretty fantastic locally. And I know you said you saw the thing the team put out, the Q&A with yeah, Joe Gibbs I, and all that. Yeah, I watched uh, like 10 minutes of a it. video of Gary Clark, Mark Rippon, mm-hmm. Brad Edwards, and uh, Brian Mitchell just like yakking about the old days. It was great. Yeah, yeah. Jamal, I don't. did you get a chance to listen to anything today? I heard Rippon uh, on Kevin Sheehan this morning. He was great. Um, a little bit. I, I, um, I listened to Brian Mitchell with Joe Gibbs and mm. Gary Sanders. Um, I yeah. think so. Yeah, it was just those two. Yeah, I was trying to think about anybody else, but I think it was those two. Um, but yeah, it was, it was cool. You know, I, I ain't gonna lie to y'all though. Now, I know people got upset earlier, not, not like directly with me. Um, and not directly with anybody I know, but when I was listening to the show with Brian Mitchell, he was saying that the youngins were were like, um, they're not trying to hear this all day. Truthfully, um, I felt the same way, and it's nothing to do with the team. It's nothing to do with the past history. It's like I don't have anything to relate to. Mm. Um, so it was it was just like for me, it's for you all to enjoy your moment. The people who experienced it. Uh, to relive it and all that stuff, that's perfectly fine. I have no issue with it. Um, my personal opinion was like, damn, do I got to hear this all day? I don't <laughs> want to hear this all day. Um, and, I mean, it, it is what it is. When you have one of the greatest scenes in the history, you got you to do what you got to do. So it's fine. Yeah. It's, I understand it. I understand where you come from. I mean, you know, you were too young. You know, you weren't around You right. know, when we went through this. But it's just for us who lived it, um, I, especially me who remembers the '80s, the '80s teams, because I'm 10 years older than Alex. Right. We, we were doing the quick math. Steve was in college. I was eight years old when the '91 yeah. Super Bowl happens. Jamal was what? Jamal, you would have been negative three. Am I so, right about that? See, people no, people got to understand that, like Washington was a team like the Patriots. Yeah. The 49ers, the Seahawks. Of today, the teams that are, I mean, Seahawks, not this year, but the teams that were in it every year and, you know, in the NFC championship game all the time, contenders, Mm -hmm. that's what Washington was and what it felt like and what we all experienced. I think Joe Gibbs only had one losing season his entire time, you know, Gibbs won. His first year, I think they went. Well, they went 500 his first year. Well, they were 500. I think they had one year where he was seven and nine, maybe. Yeah, yeah. But uh, that's what it was, and it's just so far gone now, you know, and Dan oh. Snyder has destroyed so much, uh, you know, like the last, for me, the last vestige of what was is the name Redskins. And I think there's not a small amount of irony that they're celebrating, you know, the 91 team, and then five minutes from now, they're going to say, okay, Redskins doesn't exist anymore, and we're the 
armada or something, which makes me want to vomit. But I understand the young 20 somethings, you know, are excited about the new name and all of mm-hmm. that. Cause they don't, they don't know what Redskins really meant. It's not this garbage we see today. You know, it's something totally different and the young don't understand that. And I, I understand it, but for me, I'm just, you know, I'm just never going to accept it. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I think there's definitely a generational thing when it comes to remembering those teams. Uh, you know, I was saying, I, when I when that Super Bowl was on, I remember my parents having a party at their house. I was allowed to watch with the adults for the first half, and then I had to go up to bed. And it was go up to bed was actually you go to your parents' room and watching the TV in your parents' room and fall asleep because <laughs> because they weren't paying attention to where you were. <laughs> right. They, were it, they wanted to get you know have a party with their friends. They didn't want to deal with me and my brother who would have been maybe four at that point. So well, I remember one quick story. I'll tell you, and then we got to get to the real stuff. Yeah, yeah. But so I was, it started my sophomore year in college. Right. And one guy, I remember in my dormitory was mouthing off at the beginning of the season about the Redskins and this and that. And I was like, look, dude, I'll bet you 50 bucks right now. No odds at all. Washington wins the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. And this was like in the preseason. And right. back and then, that was a lot of money, you know, especially for a college kid. Dude, and you're today about, in college, fifty bucks is still a lot. Of money. Yeah, but it was a lot of money back then yeah. in '91. Oh yeah. And, uh, and I was just sick and tired of his mouth. And so I'll fifty bucks. I don't want any odds at all. It's Washington against the field. Will right. you take it? And he was like, Yeah, easy money. And what happened? That next day, I was at his room collecting. You know. Nice. <laughs> nice. Um. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it, I, it's funny. I didn't remember this, but they apparently went 0-3 in preseason, too. So they looked really bad in preseason. Uh, the, the, Gibbs had a history of not doing particularly well in preseason. If yeah, I that's true. That's true. Um, and we saw that when he had his second stint as well. <laughs> um, all right. Well, so I know we don't want to dwell on that anniversary thing. Jamal's getting bored listening to us talk. Yeah, he yeah. Was bored. Yeah, was I was bored. already nodding off, you know. So, to, I don't know let, what you all are doing. Let's <laughs> no, talk. <I'm> t- <laughs> Let's do a recap of the the playoffs right now first. Let's get that out okay. of the way. Uh, it was a great weekend of football last weekend. It might have been one of the best playoff weekends uh, we've seen in a long, long time. Uh, at least all these games came down to the wire, right? I think every game ended on a scoring play that decided. I can't imagine. I, I can't don't remember another. I mean, I didn't go look this up, but I don't yeah. remember another divisional round playoff round where that has ever happened. Right. Right. So, you know, the quick recap of the numbers, Bills Chiefs was the big game. Of course, that was 42-36 for the Chiefs. You had the Rams and the Bucks, 30-27 Rams. Niners beat the Packers 13-10. And Bengals beating the Titans 19-16. So, you know, all tight games. Uh, re- real quick, I, I mean, I, I think it's safe to say everyone's going to say what? Chiefs-Bills is the, was the best game of the week, right? Like, that's not even a question. Yes. Um, yeah. What surprised each of you the most of that weekend slate again? I'll tell you what for what it was for me. That's easy. It was that the Packers' offense looked so bad. Mm-hmm. I realized it was snowing, and you know, I was talking to my colleague at work well, about zero, this yeah. the, the other day, and he hates outdoor football because, in his view, like the Packers could be like a greatest show on turf type, type of team if they weren't in Green Bay. And I understand his point. Um, but that was for me. I mean, the Packers offense looked just atrocious, mm. you know, and uh, that that's what surprised me the most. Jamal, what about yeah, you? I, I mean, to be honest with you, I'm in the same boat. Um, it was the Packers offense. Like when they started out seven, nothing, um, you kind of figured that they was just going to. Oh, I, it, it looked too easy for them when they scored that first touchdown. Mm. And, and then everything just went downhill like they couldn't they couldn't establish anything. Uh, they couldn't sustain anything, and then you look at the Niners. They're just they're just maintaining because they you know they're not scoring no points. All of them, they're just maintaining and and trying to right. survive. And uh, lo and behold, they get the block punt, breaks the game wide open for San Francisco, new life, et cetera, et cetera. I think if I had to give another angle though, because that was going to be my go to, I would say the next thing, um, it may have been how bad Tannehill was. Mm-hmm. I I wouldn't anticipate it. Now I'm not saying I would expect anticipated greatness from Tannehill, but you would have I would you would have thought that a, a team and a quarterback who's been to the playoffs the last three or four years 
and has had a couple iffy games, but nothing terrible. Like he has familiarity uh, with postseason play and anticipation, expectations, the 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 level of intensity that's that's required. Like all of that stuff is there, and you you go out there and and have one of your worst games. Uh, to be honest with you, of your career and in one of the biggest moments. So, um, yeah, that would that would be my that would be my my one B. My one B would have been the Bills defense totally died by the end of the Chiefs yeah, Bills game. That's a good one. Yeah, I, I mean that one, yeah. that don't forget that was the number one defense in the NFL is measured by right. points, yards, a whole bunch of different criteria, and they just looked awful by the end of that game. The, their Terrible. gas tank was not on empty. It was like the needle was pointing straight down. Yeah, the gas the tank needle. fell out of the car. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. I, so I think it's nice because my thing that surprised me the most uh, was the one game you guys didn't mention, and that was in the Rams Bucks game. How uh, Tampa Bay, who in my opinion has probably almost more weapons on offense than any other team in the league. They did nothing for the first huge chunk of that game. And, you know, the Rams kind of had control of that thing. I know Tampa, Tom Brady tried to work some magic and come back in it in the end, but it was too little too late. Uh, I was really surprised by how back technically. I mean, yeah, I know. Okay, fine. They got they got it tied. Yeah, they did tie the game. I mean, right. But they did nothing for what the first quarter and a half or half and a quarter or something like that. It was. They were pretty beat up, you know, and yeah. Tristan Worse wasn't out there, and you know, Brady was under pressure. But, yeah, I thought it, certainly that was, I think, uncharacteristic of any Tom Brady team to look that bad. It and really I don't was. think, you know, the fact that they cut crazy pills, I don't think all by itself was enough to make them look that oh, bad. no, no, no. You know. No. And crazy pills, no. great name. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one last thing I'll say about this round, because I know we want to talk about, you know, the next – the championship games a little bit, but it's funny to me how no one said anything about Brady and Aaron Rodgers retiring until they both just lost. And then that's been all that you hear the national media talking about is, are they done? Are they done? Are they done? Are they done? Uh, you know, I asked that question, like, is this their last hurrah two weeks ago? And everyone said I was insane for even asking. Well, so, what is Brady? Is Brady 44 now? Yeah. 44. Yeah. I mean, that's just insane to think that a 44 year old is playing, the yeah. National Football League. I mean, I, you have to think any given year he's going to retire right. at this point unless he says he's not. There was that guy for the Rams way back in the day who was like a quarterback and a kicker who played till 50. I can't remember his, what his name is all of a sudden. But... That was decades ago. Yeah. 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 We're Before talking all ancient. of our time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, Wait, was Rogers it George Blanda? 30... Is that hmm? who it was? Was it George so. Blanda? Yeah. I think so. Rodgers at 38, 38 is still old for a quarterback. Like we, Brady has skewed a lot of people's view on quarterback ages. And so did Manning and I guess Breeze a little, you know, but guys playing to 40 is not going to be a natural. Of course, I'd like to point out that Peyton Manning's wife, the name of Peyton Manning's wife was allegedly on a package of steroids delivered to the Manning home. And then after that happened, Peyton mysteriously retired. Yeah. Read into that what you want. I've talked about that on IJB. I'd also like to point out that his last season, Peyton Manning couldn't throw terrible. a pass more than 10 yards downfield. Yeah, he was terrible. Right. Yeah. He could manage the hell out of that yeah. first 10 yards. I, I would have but... thought the steroids would have helped him. <laughs> the <laughs> yeah, steroids that... were making it so he didn't throw everything laterally. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that, maybe it was helping him. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, funny. let's talk about these uh, championship games. I mean, they're going to be interesting. Uh, Everyone says the world is rooting against the Chiefs mostly because of Patrick Mahomes' annoying brother and wife. Did he do something else on TikTok? No, he just just kept being annoying. Okay. (laughs) Jackass. I'll tell you what, it would have infuriated me to no end. Yes. Would have been Patrick Mahomes' wife spraying champagne on me. Would have really set me off. Did you guys? I saw this yeah. video. Oh, in her annoyingly yellow 80s blazer. Yeah. Yeah. But forget the blazer. The fact that I was at a football game, I wasn't. Right. But had I been, and this crazy woman is spraying champagne on me, I would have, that really would have set me off. Yeah. That all by itself makes me run on, want to not root for the Chiefs. Sure. And, and I understand. They're annoying. They are very, and 
Patrick Mahomes, love Patrick Mahomes. He needs a divorce and he needs to kick his brother to the curb. That's all. Yeah, that can he needs. divorce his brother? Is that possible? <laughs> um, well, what's it called when you separate from your parents? Uh, <laughs> yeah, but that? that wouldn't get rid of the brother, though. I, I'm, I'm wondering, is there a way you can legally do that? No, I don't think so. I mean, yeah, and for, I'm the lawyer here. I don't think yeah. you can. Steve, I think we could come up with a new legal thing <laughs> exactly. that you could be the pioneer of. <laughs> I want to get kick the brother out of the family. <laughs> Hey, Aaron Rodgers' brother might do the same thing to Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> Aaron Rodgers basically did do that to his brother. <laughs> um, so uh, we're all rooting for the Chiefs, or against the Chiefs, right? That doesn't mean I think um, the Chiefs are going to win. <laughs> aren't gonna I don't win. know if I'm rooting. I, I like, you know, we all like football, but yeah. that's just that's just a game where I'm just hoping it's, it's, it's I expect a good game. It's going to be a unique battle. Mm-hmm. Um, hold on one second. I'm sorry. Dakota... Please, Brett, sit down. Dakota, <laughs> Brett, she, See, is, she, is, dog, she is trying to play. Uh-huh. This dog understands English. You understand this. And she does this when she disagrees with your point. <laughs> so, for me, um, it's a unique battle because you're talking about a team in the Chiefs. You know who they are. Their offensive, their offensive talent is going to be mm-hmm. the, the, the dominating factor in the game, period. Right? right? Like, you know they're going to put up points. But then you have the the Cincinnati Bengals defense, who's decent, nothing special. Um, the front, the front seven is is pretty good. Uh, but but actually, when you talk about the offense, it's a it's it's star powered. You have a quarterback that's really good. You have a wide receiver that's almost elite in his first year. I'm not going to give him that elite title yet. And then you have a good supporting cast around them and Joe Joe Max Joe Mixon the will. Except the issue that is, line, of course, I'm about to say, and that's what I'm about to say. The, the unique thing is is their old offensive line, like. They got sacked nine times last week. They gave up nine sacks. And you're going up against the Chiefs defense who's not that good statistically, but their their pressure, they they can get interior pressure on you. Mm-hmm. So it's like, how is the how are the Bengals going to survive against the Chiefs while people may say that this matchup is sweet because they're uh okay in terms of like moving the ball against a bad a, a bad defense, but if they can't move the ball against the interior pressure because of the interior pressure, excuse me. They're going to be in trouble. So I would like to know how they how they uh, how they patch things up after the, after that beatdown that they took a week ago. <laughs> um, I don't I don't even know how I did that with Dakota doing what she was doing. I wish y'all could have seen it. She is she is <laughs> killing me right now. <laughs> I don't think we've ever actually laid eyes on this dog, Jamal. I don't think you've yeah, ever put her well, on camera. Well, when Jamal does have his camera on, Jamal usually is not a camera guy. Um, but when he does have his camera on, usually Dakota's nowhere in sight. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we we um, hear her. We know she's existing because unless Jamal's sitting there with a squeaky toy, you know, as a bit. <laughs> yeah, she she's very she's very she she can be very annoying when I'm talking to people on the microphone. Like it's like she knows <laughs> that I'm talking to other people and she does right. this. <laughs> Why aren't you like, talking I will to play, me? I will play with you, Dakota. In a, in a little bit, if you just give me some time. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of the Cincinnati Bengals, I mean, my thought is the gig has got to be up at some point. I mean, they're outplaying their status a bit, I think, to me. Sure. Um, it, you know, and they're on a roll, and congratulations to them. I'm, it's not – I'm not really disparaging them. Um, you know, Joe Burrow's had an unbelievable season, really, yeah. if you look at his numbers and stuff. But, listen, I mean, I, Jamal said it. I mean, their, their defense – is mediocre and uh, not just mediocre for a playoff team, mediocre period, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and now you're facing the chiefs. Yeah. Uh, and the chiefs put up what? 42 points against last week mm-hmm. against the number one defense in the NFL. Uh, I mean, um, I, I just don't, I just, the, at some point the gig has got to be up for this Bengals team. I keep saying that every week. I know that, right. but at some point, if I keep saying it, I'm going to speak it into existence because I just don't believe they can keep this. I, I just don't believe they can keep outplaying where the universe says they should be. I guess I'll say it like that. So to mm-hmm. me, the Chiefs are a way better offense. Um, I just don't think the Bengals can outscore them. It, it's Simple simply a matter of that line is one of the worst offensive lines I've ever seen. Uh <laughs> I mean, literally, how many games in the NFL do you think have there have been nine sacks even? Like, it, th- that's a rarity in itself. I bet you uh, we can find a Redskin quarterback or two that suffered that fate. Maybe, maybe. Uh, well, Patrick years. Ramsey, I'm sure, suffered it multiple times. Probably. <laughs> you know? uh, poor dude got PTSD from Fast <laughs> <Spurrier. laughs> 
Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I, I want the Bengals to win, but I, I'm with you. In reality, the Chiefs are just a better team. Again, well, and the other thing is, I just can't believe that there's a universe in which the Cincinnati Bengals get back to the Super Bowl before Washington does. No, so I think that universe is the one we're in. I think it's gonna I, happen eventually. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it's just something's wrong with that. But yeah. but it, but from a logical standpoint, I just don't think the Chiefs can or the Bengals can keep up with what the Chiefs can put up if the Chiefs have any sort of a reasonable game. Sure. I mean, you never know. It's gonna maybe the Chiefs take a dump on the field. You never know. Mm-hmm. But if if form holds from last week. I think the Chiefs are going to outscore these guys, and uh, what I mean by obviously they're going to outscore them, but you what think I they're mean gonna is boat race them basically is what. You're yeah, saying. I think it's going to be a boat race. That's right. Yeah. Um. All right. Let's let's flip and talk about the Rams Niners battle of the old ex Washington coordinators Sean McVay versus Kyle Shanahan. Um. This one. The coaching thing between those two is what makes this so interesting to me, just because they've spent so much time together here in D.C., those two. And, you know, I honestly I'm way more of a McVeigh guy than a Shanahan guy, um, just as in terms of coaches. I, I always liked Sean McVeigh. Um, I think people give Kyle Shanahan credit for what Sean McVay did. And that's not fair, honestly. Um, I, I think it might be the other way around quite a bit for their time together. Um, uh, but I'm re- that's the one that to me is going to be more exciting just because these two coaches know each other. These two teams are in the same conference or same division. So there's going to be a little bit of a rivalry thing going on there. Um, I think this one's similar to the other game. You got to favor the Rams. It's just a better team, better offense. Uh, but, you know, the Niners pulled a good upset against the Packers last week. So you never know how these things will go. Uh, yeah. Um, it just goes to show what a great quarterback will do. Think mm-hmm. about Matthew, what Matthew Stafford's been through. He was suffering in maybe one of maybe one or two franchises that are worse than Washington, Detroit. Yeah. You know, Detroit's horrible, terrible owner, terrible franchise, terrible front office, terrible. Curse. You know, they, they ran off Barry Sanders. They ran off Calvin Johnson, Mm -hmm. you know, two of the greatest ever at their respective positions. And everybody kind of thought Matt Stafford was a dude who's sort of like a, older version of Kirk Cousins a bit where he's putting up a bunch of stats, but he can't win anything. Right. Well, it turns out it was just Detroit. Cause if you look at what he did and, in, in he's done this year in LA, I mean, he's put up, he put up almost 4,900 yards. He's in the NFC championship game. They mm-hmm. have a granted, they have a ton of talent around him. Um, uh, but I, I, you get to me, I think this is a closer game. I, I'm not sure the chiefs Bengals is going to be close. It'll be a boat race, but I'm not. I think this is a more competitive, closer game. My rooting interest certainly is with the Rams because I'm not rooting for Kyle Shanahan and Trent Williams under any circumstance. But f- from a logical standpoint, I think this is a very close game because the 49ers, like you said, they showed something last week somehow in adverse circumstances. Mm. So I think it's close, but the, at the end of the day, the Rams once again probably have too much offense for the 49ers. That's my thought. Yeah, I'm 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 rooting for the Rams uh for for different reasons. I don't have no issues with with Kyle and, and Trent, but I do like Stafford and I do like the underdog story um in a sense that there was a lot of people who had feelings that, you know, Stafford wasn't a winner. Stafford couldn't overcome Detroit, you know, he is who he is. He couldn't elevate the team. Um, and to an extent, that's true, but you got to recognize talent when you see it. Right. And you just knew he was in a terrible situation and it was hard for him to get out of that, um, especially with that organization. So I'm just rooting for uh, that opportunity that he has with the Los Angeles Rams and also the opportunity to give Sean McVay and the other the other players as well on that roster. Um, hopefully they can go get one for Matt. And, and especially Odell, too. So I don't have no problem with him. The thing is, though, I think that it's going to be a close game. Um, I think that the Rams will keep it. I mean, the Niners will keep it close. The spread was at three and a half. Right. Um, 
this evening. And I think the the issue with the spread is that it's too close. The, the number is very short for a team that's as talented as the Rams playing at home. Um, and I think that's indicative of what the, the odds makers see in the San Francisco 49ers. Um, I, I, like I said, I want the Rams to win. I do think the Rams will win, but I think it'll be a close game. I don't think it'll be a blow up. I, I think the X factor is going to be Cooper Cup. You know, this guy's the number one receiver in the NFL this year, 1,900, more than 1,900 yards. I mean, that guy's a magician when it comes to route running. And if you look at San Francisco's corners, who, you know, and their safeties, their, their defensive backfield, who do they really have that's great? Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, mm-hmm. uh, who do they really have? I mean, they don't have a shutdown corner necessarily. Um, so I, I, I think Cooper Cup may end up being the X factor in this game. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I think that's a big X factor. I do think these coaches' familiarity with each other's schemes and philosophies is going to play into this a lot. Um, and honestly, may, again, it's my bias towards Sean McVay. I think it favors him in that Kyle's all about these zone running schemes. That's really the strength of his team, obviously. Uh, whereas Kyle may know uh, what Sean McVay wants to do, which is going to be a passing game heavy attack. But you're going to pick up chunk yards in the passing game more than the running game in the end. So if you can shut those things down, you know, one or two big breakaways in that passing game is going to matter. Um, so I, I think it is going to be closer, like you guys said, but I still think it's the Rams in the end. And so I, I guess it's Rams chiefs, a battle of Missouri for uh, the Super Bowl. Yeah. I mean, my brooding interest would be Bengals Rams. Yeah. Yeah. But what I think, yeah, I predict Rams. Even by the way, the line in the Chiefs game Monday was Chiefs minus seven. Okay. Jamal, I don't know if it's changed today or not, but that's what it was. Still Monday. the same. Yeah. yeah. Um. Oh, it, by the way, if Matt Stafford wins a Super Bowl, Detroit will riot and burn down Detroit. <laughs> Detroit has only the, you know, has only themselves to blame. They well, have a horrible they have owner the Ford family friend. to blame. <laughs> yeah, the Ford family to blame. Yes, the Ford family has only themselves to blame. Right. What I should have said. Yes. The city of Detroit cannot blame, <laughs> you know, all they do is keep on supporting a terrible team. <laughs> like, that's all they do. It's not a good, it's, a, God bless the people who live there. I mean, the weather's miserable. It's dirty. It's crime written. It's a tough place to be. Yeah, all they the factories probably, are closed. Yeah. Yeah. They probably deserve better than the worst franchise in football. Yeah. Well, they had the Pistons in basketball for a while. They were good, right? I mean, the basketball you know. doesn't count. Well, you know, I'm just saying they, they've had other good sports teams, the Red Wings in hockey. And I know you don't count hockey either, but <laughs> I know I count hockey. I'm just not a huge hockey fan. Hockey yeah. counts. Soccer does not count. Soccer's not a sport. Okay, soccer doesn't count. You don't count basketball anymore. What about baseball? You still count baseball. I love right? baseball. Yeah. 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 Okay. So now Steve's a baseball hockey guy. That's his. Those are his two sports. I, I, I've just I've not I've not ever watched a ton of hockey. I don't have anything against hockey. Yeah. It's a fun game to watch. I just haven't ever really you, gotten into it. You also live in you know pretty far south where there aren't isn't a I've lot. I've lived all over the country. I've lived all over the world though, Alex. I mean, yeah, but it's, in the last. Since you, you know, said yes, I've been in Texas, yes, for yeah. a while. They now. don't play a lot of hockey down there in Texas, they do yeah. in Dallas, they don't where I am. Yeah, well, not no, I meant like kids don't. No, yeah, yeah. Um, it's it, it's it's it was in the upper 50s today. We in January, right. we don't play winter no. sports down here. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, I know we want to talk D-line, free agency. Uh, do we want to hit this Virginia Stadium Authority thing real Let me run, quick? Let's save that. Let me run through the salary. Okay, I you want to the salary, the salary cap. cap? Yeah, I'm I not going to spend a ton of time on it, but let's do that as a lead-in to the free agent. Okay, all right, let's do salary so, cap then. That's yeah, so 2022 salary cap, roster salary cap. Washington, <laughs> excuse me has 50 players signed, including the Futures deal, guys, right. uh, for 2022. And um, with the, the salary cap has basically been fixed um, at uh, $208.2 million. So mm-hmm. there's a roll. It's called a rollover cap. Um, how this works is every year each team audits their salary cap and reports to the NFL a number 
that they think is the unused amount of cap from last year. Now this, I don't think this includes the rollover from the previous year, yeah. you know, but, uh, and then the NFL audits a number and it could change if the NFL's audit comes out differently. But bottom line is Washington's rollover number that they reported last week was 4 million, 80,000 and change. So based on all of that, I have Washington, uh, if I can go back up, at 35.7 million under the cap right now um mm-hmm. that in in a turn we're getting to the d line so um and they've got one two three four, they've got 11 players i believe signed to the d line right now um yeah 11 um they don't have a middle linebacker on the roster at all technically no yeah no the linebackers are davis holcomb and hudson that's really it if you, whatever you want to call landon collins they re-signed Corn Elder to a to a to a new deal, so he's in. Um, their corners are him, Fuller, Jackson, and St. Juice. That's it. Um, safeties: Collins, Curl, Everett, and Derek Forrest. Tight end is a problem. We went over tight end last week. Bates, Reyes, and Logan Thomas, yeah. who's hurt. That's it. Um, they're looking okay numbers wise on offensive line, but I mean, Brandon Scherf is a free agent. Um, they've got seven guards and three offensive tackles The um, in the seven guards instantly, the, the, there's a couple of practice squatters, but the guys who can play, who've played in games are Eric Flowers, Chase Rue and Wes Schweitzer and the rest of them are a bunch of practice squad guys. Mm. So that's not good. Um, seven wide receivers, Deami Brown, Gandy Golden, Harmon, uh, McLaurin, Michael Markin, who was a practice squatter. On a, on a futures deal, Dax Mill and Curtis Samuel. And then the running backs, they signed a new running back, Reggie Bonifon, Bonifon to a, a futures deal. If you don't know who he is, he is I a don't. 2018 under at free agent out of Louisville, six foot two fifteen. So they've got him on a futures deal. Um, and then they don't have a kicker on the roster right now. Cheeseman and Tress Way are the specialists. Joey Sly was on a one-year contract. Brian Johnson was on a one-year contract. Um, and so they don't have a kicker. And okay. quarterbacks, it's only Taylor Haneke. And yeah. that is the roster update. Okay. Uh, so, you know, that's a decent amount of cap room that they have to play with. Not great, but, you know. It's going to go lot. up because there's also some adjustments that will be made. So it'll yeah. be a little bit more than that, but I just don't have that right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Jamal, uh, you started working on the defensive line free agency thing. Uh, I don't know if you have your notes in front of you, but do you want to start taking us through some of the free agents uh, that could be out there for Washington? I I imagine we all would agree that defensive tackle not going to be a big priority for this team in free agency. I should have said that Tim Settle is a free agent. That's the big yeah. free agent uh, from this group. Yeah, I mean, it's it's underwhelming. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you all that up front in terms of the the options out there for Washington given their their current situation. But um, yeah, the 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 one lone free agent that's pending on the defensive line for Washington is Tim Settle, 24 years old, set to hit the free agency market in March. Obviously, with the depth that Washington has, and Matt Ioannidis, Deron Payne, and Jonathan Allen, Tim Settle, um. Unfortunately, you know, he's going to be looking for other opportunities. He's young. He has, let me go ahead and reposition myself. Sorry. Um, he's young, but he also has a production in years past that can kind of warrant him getting that uh, role to compete as a starter uh, elsewhere. And for Washington, he, in 2021 at least, he had, I think, 20% of the snaps on the year. Mm-hmm. Um, of the total snaps. Um, I know, like, for example, um, there was, who was it, Matt Ioannidis. He was the out of the three in terms of Allen, Payne, and Ioannidis. Ioannidis had, I think, like, four, three or 400 snaps, right? And mm-hmm. Settle was way under that with, like, 200-something. And so that kind of just gives you an indication of where they were collectively on the year with Settle. Um, and, and for obvious reasons, those three had those opportunities because they they had the, the money but and not the higher status. And, you know, they had to get their best people on the field as well. So all that to say, Settle's probably going to move on and, and find his opportunity to get some cash elsewhere. And 
and see what he can do with his career. Um, good player, though. Nothing wrong with that. In terms of potential free agent targets, I think what Washington missed the most this past off season or this past season was a veteran presence. Um, and I, I think that was big uh, mm-hmm. in the sense that uh, – the guidance that you can offer while also playing on the field in a spot role, knowing that you, you know how football works on the pro level, you know about uh, the awareness that you need to have, you know about the discipline that you need to play with uh, can, can kind of rub off on the, the younger guys as well. Uh, when you, when you show up in practice or when you show up in the game as well. So um, I think those, those talents and skill sets are important for 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 Washington and obviously when you're dealing with uh Montez Sweat, Chase Young, and obviously the defensive tackles that we listed already that'll come back, you kind of have to round out that 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 unit, defensive line unit, uh with some presence who actually knows what they're doing. And with that being said, uh like I said, it's not gonna be very uh intriguing off the rip, but you're looking at Derek Barnett, um Derek Barnett is a 25-year-old defensive end uh, currently playing for the Philadelphia Eagles. The issue with Barnett, um, he was pretty underwhelming. He was a first-round pick in 2017. Um, he posted two sacks in 16 games for the Eagles this year. And over the course of his five years, um, had just 21 and a half sacks, five seasons. So, I mean, obviously that's not good, but you're looking at a guy who can benefit from a res- reserve role knowing that Washington – and this is going to be context moving forward for the other defensive linemen that I'll go through. But um, you're looking at a guy who can benefit from a role that emphasizes uh, a constant rotation on the defensive line, right? Mm-hmm. These, this, this is a guy who can pick up what, whatever Washington is going to be teaching at that position, but also um, trying to reinvent himself for the future to be able to cash out next time he hits the market, if he hits the market. Um and see where there goes. Odds are he's going to hit the market because you're you're looking at Montez Sweat and Chase Young. Like those are the two staples uh, that you're going to have to try and retain, uh, barring an unforeseen drop in production to to, to bust potential. Uh, I don't mm-hmm. think that's going to happen with Sweat and Young. So that's option one for a defensive end. Uh, second defensive end I'm looking at is William Golson. 30-year-old defensive end who's currently playing for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He was a fourth-round pick in 2013, uh, and he's been a buck his entire career. Uh, the issue with him again, sack totals, uh, 19 and a half sacks in that time span. But I think the difference with with Golston, with as as compared to Barnett, is that Golston has went through uh, plenty of issues during his time as Tampa. Uh, and, and not to do, not a lot to do with his own. Um, he's faced several coaching issues that hindered his development. Golston had to deal with initially, I'll name off the coaches: Greg Schiano in his rookie year, Lovey Smith and Leslie Frazier um, as a duo for two years. Then Mike Smith who took over the defense right before Todd Bowles arrived in 2019. Mm-hmm. So you're dealing with a ton of coaching opportunities or ton of coaching changes. Excuse me that kind of hindered his ability to, you know, produce or even lock down a scheme and, and how they want to play uh, up front. And so with him catching on late with Tampa and in the Todd Bowles defense, you have an opportunity to actually, kind of, you know, um, show, show something for yourself in the off, I mean, excuse me, in free agency. And I think if Washington wanted to go down, go down that route to kind of find a, uh, a seasoned veteran with tons of experience in many different schemes, but also has that championship caliber mentality. Uh, Golson is going to be your option in terms of having that veteran depth at the edge rushing position. Um, and there, you know, there goes that. Now, the, the last two that I have are interior linemen. They're defensive tackles who are meant to sh- strictly fill gaps um, and create opportunities for uh, rushers, edge rushers on stunts or, or twists or actually help out the linebackers on the second level to, to flow a little bit easier. Um, and that's Daquan Jones of the Carolina Panthers. He's a 30-year-old defensive tackle um, who was drafted in the fourth round by the Tennessee Titans. Uh, and I, I forget which year he was drafted, but uh, he was drafted by the Tennessee Titans, I want to say like 2016 or 2017. Um, but he's played one year in Carolina 
and he's 320 pounds. He would be a space eater, like I said, um, and, and that would be an option for, for Washington. And then obviously Justin Ellis, for those in the DMV area, is familiar with family plays for the Baltimore Ravens, 31-year-old defensive tackle. He's 350 pounds. Um, and again, same same service that Daquan Jones provides. Uh, he's a he's a guy who's going to eat up space and, and, and wreak havoc in the middle. Now, obviously, when you look at those those type of talent that that we listed with Jones and Ellis, you know, you you kind of point to, well, is this a three four scheme? Guess what? You don't necessarily need to have him play in a three four to to have a role carved out for them. Washington needs to get better at stopping the run. Um, yes, they did okay. Uh, tenth overall, but at the same time, like there was games where it wasn't so consistent. And if you want to be dominant in one aspect, you better find out, you know, what you want to do. And I think that's opportunity for if they if they want to do the the edge rusher thing with Golston and Barnett. Okay, if you want to find a way to to stop the run, you look at some good interior linemen that can help contribute to that cause. So those are the four that I previewed. Obviously, there'll be a Plenty of other names that end up coming up that'll be surprise cuts or or just something where uh, under the radar signings that you really probably couldn't think of too much. But those are the four that I highlighted in my mm. review for Washington. Um, of the guys you named, Will and Goldston, I think, intrigues me most. You know, he's a guy who's a bit older. Um, he sort of knows what his role is. You know, he's not – there have been times when he's been a consistent starter – in Tampa, but there's times he hasn't been, you know, and I think he can come in and here and be a pro and fill in some gaps, especially with Tim settle leaving, you know, with the deficiency in run defense that they've had at times, like you said, um, I think he would be a decent signing and, and maybe he's ready to leave Tampa, you, you know, um, Derek Barnett. Um, I get it. But I kind of wonder if he wouldn't want to come to D.C. I mean, he's been he has been a starter his entire career and his numbers tailed off there at the end. You know, he's he played on the fifth year option in 2021. Yeah. Uh, so I tend to think that Philadelphia may let him go. But I just have a, it just seems to me that he may be a type of guy who would want to go be a starter somewhere. And that's not going to uh, he might not get that opportunity in D.C. barring injury because of obviously you know, the guys they have up front, um, you know, and, and yeah, the space eaters, Ellis, uh, you know, those are good selections. Um, if I was to pursue somebody, it might be Golston though. I, they could use a veteran to come straight and, you know, crack some skulls in that locker room, frankly, and, um, keep some guys in line. And maybe that's Golston being a little older. Yeah. I, I think we're all on the same page there. Um, you know, they let Chris or not Chris Cooley, uh, Ryan Kerrigan. They walk. let Chris Cooley go too. <laughs> yeah, but I, we're talking about defensive ends. So they let. Uh, I'm just saying Kerrigan, what you said was not factually inaccurate. That's all. True, true. Uh, it's been a long day. I've been up since like four in the morning. Um, they they let yeah, Kerrigan go, and they sorely needed that you know veteran defensive end to kind of keep. Sweat and Chase Young on the straight and narrow, it seems like, in hindsight. Um, so, yeah, they kind of need to find somebody to replace that role. Not to mention, as good as the backups we had were, when those two went out, we definitely had a depth issue at defensive end. And that was a problem. We we haven't mentioned this either. Chase Young, who knows when he's going to be ready with his injury? Like he could miss a good chunk of this season if if things don't go exactly according to plan. ACL injury, right? Like that, we we know how long that can take to heal. Could take more than a year. Yeah. So, I I, I would be a okay if they made a move for someone like Goldston. I'd even be okay if they were to try and go a little more aggressive, go for like an even larger name veteran who could then take a backseat role. Some. Someone like uh, just looking at the list of defense ends, who's uh, Javon Clowney was a big name, hasn't ever quite lived up to his reputation, right? Like a lot of people have said, uh, they see a lot of Chase Young or Javon Clowney in Chase Young, and how he performed last year. 
So maybe somebody like that is the way you go. I know he's only 29, but like I could see that being an, a, a route too, where you you're bringing him in one to be a starter until Young's healthy, and then two kind of be that leadership, uh, that veteran for those guys. Um, in terms of Chase, so his ATL ACL tear was in week 10, right, which was November 14th. So uh, it it seems to me to be a stretch to assume he could be back in, you know, 10, 11 months. Yeah. You know, so you have to think that maybe he's a fast healer. Who knows? But he's also a big guy. It's tougher for them. You have to think that the odds would say at least he may be on the pup list to start the year. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. You know, and so, yeah, they could use a veteran. Now, the problem with William Goldston is he's not going to be cheap. No, none none of these ve- good veterans are going to be especially cheap. Golston though. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, he's you know, I've just looked up his contract while Jamal was talking. He was on a five year, twenty seven million dollar contract, thirteen million guaranteed. That's not to say that he necessarily is going to draw that, but I mean, he's going to be. It's not going to be a cheap. He's not going to be a veterans minimum type of guy. You're going to have to give him real money, multiple years, guarantee. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's he's an investment. Absolutely. I mean. You know, like some of the other names that are out there, JPP is out there. Uh, he's what thirty three. He made twelve million dollars last year. I, you know what? Here's the thing, though. I think Washington is fairly happy with their pass rushers, their dedicated pass rushers. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I mean, they. I just call me crazy, but I mean, they drafted Chaka Tony. Who's the other guy, you know, didn't play. Yeah, yeah. I always get the guys with two names. I always get them mixed up. James Smith Williams and the other one with two names. Yeah. <laughs> um. So I don't know if they're like JPP. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if he fits the bill more than Golston. I, I've always looked at Golston as a more complete player mm-hmm. than JPP. I mean, maybe I'm wrong because they're both defensive ends, but I've just looked at Golston as a bit more of a, more than just a dedicated pass rusher, which is what I've always thought of JPP as. They could always bring Kerrigan back. <laughs> that's yeah, kind no, of admitting defeat for Ron, wouldn't happen. it be? I mean, <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah, I know. That's, it's that's not... probably worse than not finding the quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's true. Uh, he, he, they will never admit that they were wrong to do that. Let him go. Um, yeah, I, Ron well, I think those are a guy that looks backwards very often. No, I know. I think, you know, I think you're definitely on point with that one. And on the idea of getting a good space eater on the defensive yeah, line absolutely. if they get anything. Yeah, they, well, they could that, use both those. That's Tim Settle's highest and best use. Right, right. You know, he was brought in to be a nose tackle in a 3-4. Yeah. So, it you know, it made a lot of sense. Um. All right, anything else we want to say about the defensive line? Not unless Jamal has something to add. Uh, nah, I'm good. I'm yeah. good. I am Not looking forward mo- to seeing how they address the position, just generally. Um, how they're going because it's a need. It's it's really need to to have some help. Um, with these younger guys and and Chase Young and Sweat and even yeah. even Smith Williams and and Casey Tuhill and all those and Shaka Tony and all those people. So it's it's important. And and it I was, think it's something we all overlook a little too as fans. It was William Bradley King was the other guy I was thinking of, right. by the way. The other guy with two names. I wanted to say Smith and Schuster, but, you know, that that's a <laughs> no, not term. no, Isn't, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah. They all right. Published books. Oh, right. They're the book publishers. They're not a law firm. <laughs> I don't know what I'm thinking. Uh, all right. Why don't we talk really quickly? Because we got a few minutes left. Uh, there was some news that came out of the Richmond that the Virginia Senate and the Virginia House have both passed bills to redo the whole stadium authority that was, you know, for way back when, when they were trying to get an expansion MLB team in Virginia. Uh, they're trying to get that stadium authority now to uh, be the, you know, the people who get a football stadium in Virginia. Not a whole lot there, but one thing I heard that I thought was interesting, Steve, is that they're trying to, if they build a stadium, the state wants majority control over the stadium. Okay, so this is very uninteresting. Mm. Just so everybody knows, most stadiums are under this type of ownership situation. It sure. is very, very rare 
that an individual NFL owner also owns the stadium. A guy like Stan Kroenke, who owns SoFi, is a major, major real estate developer. Right. Um, Jack Kent Cook built FedEx on the cheap, mainly because he couldn't get it, all these governments in the D.C. area on board, you know, which is the tough part, it, you know. It is, and it's a different world now than it was in 1995 and six. You know, when he was doing this. Right. Um, most NFL stadiums and most basketball arenas are owned by a private entity controlled by some combination of the local governments, the city, the county, the state. So, and then what you do is you will negotiate a split of things like parking and concession revenues you know for the team sure. that's how it works and so if you could and because think about it i mean if if a state government is going to give out hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars it's probably not just going to be a repayable loan i mean they do want equity in the thing if they're right. going to spend that kind of money and, and and um we don't do politics on this show but it's worth noting and i'm not trying to get political here but it's worth noting that glenn youngkin is a brand new governor of Virginia just elected, just took office like a week ago or a couple yeah. weeks ago. Any new governor would be try would try to make a splash immediately, and one way he could make a splash is to roll out the red carpet for for uh, for Washington, uh, you know, and 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 gambling's on the table, which is going to be a mandatory. Yeah, you know, thing for Dan Snyder, no matter where it goes. But but I don't read anything into the idea that the state wants to have a controlling ownership interest in the real property. That's the norm. The the, the exception is the owner owning the owning stadium. So I, I, for me, um, it's the same problem exists as existed a couple of weeks ago when we talked about this, which is that Loudoun County, it's just so far out. I mean, for right. the people of D.C. and in Maryland and all that, I mean, it's I don't know how much the team cares because they'll sell tickets. Probably either they're going to sell tickets or they won't sell tickets no matter what. It has nothing to do with where the stadium goes, I, I don't think. Um, but I just think it's so far out, it's almost not in the DMV area. I, if it were me and I was Dan Snyder and Glenn Youngkin, the governor, um, I would make a hardcore press to find something move hell or high water to find something inside the beltway that would yeah, be or goal. even on the beltway like you know right like we talked golf course we talked about it's and that's not big enough no. you know for a whole development but yes in or on the beltway i would try to move heaven and earth to do that if i were dan snyder and glenn youngkin sure sure i think you know it, it, logistically that's what actually makes sense putting it in the middle of nowhere, like Loudon, well, it's easy. Or, you know, yeah. it's it's not unplatted land. There's nothing out there. You, you just go buy a empty field and a cow pasture or two and build right. a stadium. I mean, that's the easiest, simplest thing to do. But I just don't know if it's the best thing. And it's certainly the cheapest. I mean, you're talking land inside the beltway and you want to buy like 200 acres. Yeah. I mean, that's a I mean, enormous amount of money. I mean, enormous the real problem is there's just not. 200 acres that exist inside the beltway no you'd have to de de demolish a whole lot of things and it's just yeah. very 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 expensive <laughs> yes yeah all right so that's the little mini update that came out this week with the whole stadium thing um i think that covers all the news from the team this week uh my one update would be that i have been paying attention to the trademark records Right. Uh, very closely in the past couple weeks, and uh, there is nothing new. My my expectation, Steve, if you check them on uh, February 2nd at like 6 a.m., you'll see something. Well, <laughs> you can't really do that because it takes a couple of days to get it updated from what I can see. So oh, okay. it, odds are I probably won't find it until after. Okay, so they'll file it. If they filed it on 2-2, that you wouldn't see it till the next week or something. No, probably yeah. not. I got it. All right, so I that mean, you might should... be able to get like an insider at the patent and trademark office or something. I mean, if you're an IP lawyer in DC, there may be a way, but in terms of right. normal attorney stuff that I can do, no, I won't be able to find right, it. Right, right. And me, who has a friend who works in the AV department or used to work in the AV department in the PTO, they know nothing. They don't get any information. Oh no, no, yeah, they would. <laughs> they'd be fired if they. <laughs> yes, exactly. Things like that. Exactly. 
All right, guys, that does it for this week's episode. Hope you all enjoyed it. Tune in next week when Steve and I will yell about how terrible the new name is. And Jamal, I think uh, Jamal will yell. I don't know if he cares as much. Yeah, so that comes out yeah, on Wednesday. So we are going to record the next show on that day. So right. the odds are our next show will be a very brief preview of whatever free agency group I decided it was. Which I can't I don't remember. remember. <laughs> I think it's interior offensive line. And okay. then it'll be 100%. And then we'll, the rest of it will be the name. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We will see you guys then. Later. <laughs>